Okay. All right. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. Our guest today is Gil Barlove. Gil, are you ready to be great today? Yes, very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jason, for uh, hosting me today. Yes, thank you. Gil founded Home Roots, combining his passion for furniture, e commerce, and technology to disrupt the way selling and buying furniture is done with a novel wholesale platform. Home Roots leverages community buying power by uniting sellers of furniture, lighting, lighting, and home decor, and retailers of licensed trade in one place, making the B2B shopping experience in this vertical as easy as the B2C shopping experience. They help sellers and buyers increase profit margin and reduce overhead. So, Gil, thanks for being here again. I really appreciate it. I know you've got a lot going on. So, first thing, can you kind of explain to us, like, how did you come with the intersection of um, furniture, e-commerce, and tech? Because, like, furniture and tech kind of doesn't really go together, most people would think, right? So, can you kind of, kind of explain how you combine those three things? Sure. So uh, I'll tell a little bit about my background uh, to start off with. So that will explain the story of how I got to this. Uh, so in my background, I'm a software engineer. I grew up, uh, you know, in the, in the tech environment. Um, about 20, 20 years ago, I got involved in a project uh, and eventually led it as well that connected Toys R Us with Amazon when Amazon was looking to expand into the toy section. So that uh, knowing that, you know, my tech background um, and at that point in time, I was more focusing on web development, you know, that led me into that e-commerce section with, with Amazon. And I think that's where I found my true passion where you combine tech with e-commerce. Uh, fast forwarding years to come, another decade, I spent a lot of time into um, a lot of uh, B2C sales or e-commerce sales in this uh, world. This industry have definitely uh, evolved a lot during that time. But as I was doing it, I realized that there was a void in the B2B world, in the B2B space, right? There's a lot of solutions out there. If you want to sell online to consumers, there are plenty of solutions. But if you want to sell wholesale online, where do you really go, right? There's no digital platform that enables you that. So like Amazon, I needed to find a category where you start off with to prove that this model worked, that there was room for B2B. And I was a friend of mine who was working in the furniture industry, uh, knew me, knew my passion, he invited me to one of the trade shows down in High Point where I was more of a fly on the wall. And I listened uh, for the whole week. I've visited different showrooms, listened to different people in the space. And I realized, okay, that's the industry. So that, that's the industry where we can put the triangle together of e-commerce, tech, and furniture and kind of marry them all together. And that became eventually home roots. And that's a, that's a background. So Gil, can you tell us what, what was your age when you finally found your passion? My age? Yeah. Um, I will say that I was in my mid twenties. Mid twenties. Okay. Yes. I think a lot of people nowadays they're like, Oh, I haven't found my passion yet, but your passion has to come organically, right? You just can't, you just can't force your passion. It has to come like kind of naturally. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it, it, it has to come naturally. And, and you know it when it happens to you. You just know it. Um, I personally always loved tech. I always loved software development. That was, for me, a passion. I just, at some point in time, I was looking for something more. I felt like I need something more. I needed to understand more of the business side, not just the tech side. And when it came into the e-commerce space, that's where I found the two passions together. And uh, since then, that's, that's what I've been focusing on for... Um, the rest of my life. <laughs> and, 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 and have to imagine your passion for what you do now has to be very great because you had a very, like, a extremely successful tech career, right? I used to, like, you know, yes. mentor CTOs, 20 years. Can you talk a little back about what you, what you achieved in tech? Yeah, so I, um, after I departed from uh, Toys R Us, I decided to uh, partner up. I co-founded another company uh, that basically helped brands sell online, right? And... Um, you know, we're talking about the early 2000, 2004, five, six, you know, e-commerce was not as what it is today. Uh, even Amazon was not it is what it is today. And many brands did not actually know how to monetize um, their, their products online. And there was still a little bit of a feeling of a burnout from what happened with the dot-com uh, 
um, you know, bubble getting burst up. So we formed that company that basically enables brands and we were doing everything for them. We were doing the logistics, we're doing the warehousing, the fulfillment, we're doing the marketing, the branding, everything for them. And, um, and that went very well. After, but after a couple of years, I realized that, you know, we're heading towards um, a certain saturation in the market. And as soon as we had it closer to 2009, 2010, and I felt that I, uh, it's time to exit. So I sold my shares in the company and kind of moved on to, to the next big thing. But that basically opened up the door for me for many um, experiences in the logistical space, in the wholesale import export, um, as well as the technology as a background in e-commerce and working with retail. And I think combining all those things together really gave me a certain edge over um, other candidates or other companies out there that were offering their services. Because in my case, I was all in one. I was able to oversee many things and understanding the complete flow of a business, not just one side from the tech side or one side about, okay, let me deal about the import or the export or let me deal with the warehousing. But I was able to actually converse and speak to everybody in all their languages and translate from one language to another and attend all those conversations seamlessly. And I think that's what set me personally apart uh, than everybody else. But it all came just because I was very, very passionate about what I was doing. I, was, I really loved and still love uh, what I'm doing. And without that, just it, it would have never happened. So Gil, I could be wrong, but are, are you from the country of Israel or Israeli? I'm, I'm yes, wrong. originally, yes. I, uh, I grew up in the tech, in the um, startup nation of Israel. I started the career over there. I worked in two different startups, uh, totally different spaces. Nothing related to, uh, uh, to e-commerce, uh, nothing related to, um, um, to retail or import and export, but that gave me the foundations of what I have today. So I don't think most people in America realize how like tech heavy, how much, how much, how vibrant the tech scene is in Israel, like how much is a tech startup. You said innovation nation, startup nation. Can you give like a little bit, maybe a quick background, like how Israel got to this point? So I tell you what, there is something in the culture and in, in the DNA that um, of Israel and Israelis in, in general. I, I will speak on their behalf, but you know, I'm just giving you my my view of things. Um, Israelis are very hard workers as a nature, as, 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 a, as part of their DNA. And they're very creative and they don't, it, it's, it's, you can see it in some cases in good ways and some cases in a little bit, uh, maybe in the less appealing ways, but it, 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 people that don't necessarily conform to a certain reality, they don't accept certain realities. They're all the time trying to change it and therefore being creative about the way about finding solutions to different problems and not resting until the solution is found. And this is the culture that I grew up as a kid and working in startup, this was implemented. That was actually brought into, into the reality. But working hard, I can tell you that um, this is something that I've not seen um, in other cultures, not that frequently at least. But I tell you that we were working around the clock. I remember myself as a software engineer, sometimes spending the day in the office, um, you know, coming in Monday morning and not leaving until Tuesday night. And that just was the, the culture. You just, if you are not done with something, you're not gonna go home. And, and that was fine. And everybody was bought into the idea. And that, that's the culture. And I think understanding that and growing into that, that what makes um, companies in that space move significantly faster than equivalent uh, companies in other places in the world. And I think that's what makes the difference. Yeah, I know. Like, you know, there's always these, like, these white papers. I know, VC stats, startup stats. You know, all the all cases would be. If it was always right at the top, right? I mean, it's always right, right there. Per, I mean, per capita. What do you, what do you like? Data you want to use? Like, Israel's like at the top. Yeah, or close I mean, to it's the because top. Because of that, it's because of, it's it's that culture. It's that relentless culture that will not stop until it gets to where it needs to go and it never gets to where it needs to go it always you know there's always hunger hunger for more and that's what's exciting about it i mean uh, i i personally uh miss it at times despite working like crazy hours i do miss it at times and, and how often do you go back to visit uh i try my best to come and visit at least uh once every two years 
I try my best. Um, hopefully, it will be more within within time. And, and how's the flight? I'm guessing it's like a 15, 16 hour flight. Uh, on the way there, if I'm not mistaken, it's about 10 and a half hours or so. And on the way back, it's about 11 and a half hours. Uh, if you go direct. Okay. The direct flight. And there are direct flights from most, uh, you know, central airports. Like um, I'm, I'm from New Jersey. So here we have Newark, you know, there's direct flight, JFK, there's direct, direct flight. Um, and, and how old are you when you moved to, you moved to the United States? Almost 20 years ago. 20 years ago, so it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, my, I have three kids. They're all born here. Um, my, el my eldest daughter, uh, she just graduated high school this week. So it's been here for a long time. <laughs> um, if you remember, right. can you, if you remember, can you talk about some of the culture shock you had that come to America from Israel or some of the differences? Or yes. I was? Um, so I, I always tell this. So it's funny, but because what the, you know, the way I perceive Israel is definitely not a third world country. Right. And it definitely was not 20 years ago when I, when I left. Um, and I can tell that Israel um, is, is definitely a Western uh, culture in nature. So we grew up on many American um, cultural things, whether it's from videos or from uh, on the games, whether it's books or um, anything, you know, uh, restaurants. America was not foreign um, to Israel, but yet when I moved here, I did have a cultural shock. It was very uh, challenging at first because I did not know the terminology. English was not an issue because uh, we speak English from a very young age. The problem was with more of the terminology. So I always tell that story that about a bank when I first uh, came into a bank to open up an account, right? And uh, the banker asked me, okay, what type of an account do you want? And now in Israel, I'm going to give you a transla direct translation, right? In Israel, uh, for the checking account, you call it come and go. Why come and go? Because you have money coming, coming in and then it leaves the account. So come and go. And so the banker asked me, okay, what type of a checking do you want? What type of account do you want? You want checking account? Do you want high performance? Do you want saving? And for me, checking rendered, the first thing it registered in my mind was checks, you know, writing checks. I said, no, I don't need an account to write checks. I know, and I definitely savings, I knew what it is. And high performance, I had no clue what it meant. Uh, so I said, listen, do, do you have any account for come and go? And he looked at me as if, what the heck am I uh, <laughs> talking about? Uh, and I thought, listen, I need money to you know flow in and flow out, like 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 liquid money, you know. Uh, and it took a while for me to be able to translate, but then I felt like a complete uh, <laughs> idiot. That's so uh, funny. Yeah. So so that was one incident. Um, the second incident was for me when I first um, tried to get a car. And again, I moved here. I, I don't have any family here in the States. My wife does have, um, does have uh, an uncle and a brother, but uh, when I first moved in, um, you know, I wanted to get a car. And so I went to the dealership and, you know, in Israel, you don't argue, uh, there's no negotiation about um, uh, the car's price, right? So you, you go to a dealership, you buy a car and that's a, that's the price that you pay. You don't negotiate. And here's how I came in, um, went into the dealership, and I was given a certain price. Now, in my mind, I'm comparing the price of that car compared to how much it will cost in Israel. And I'm thinking to myself, holy cow, I'm saving a lot of money. In Israel, it costs about two times more than what it costs here. And I'm thinking, wow, I really found a good deal. Then I'm about to sign off and I'm calling off my wife and saying, listen, I think we've got the best deal on the car. I really want to get this car. And then she asked me, what's the price? And I'm telling her, tell me, you're crazy. This is super expensive. You got to negotiate. Did you negotiate? Did you do anything? And I'm like, no, I did not know that you need to negotiate. So all those little things that you don't, you, you just don't know. It makes you eventually feel a little bit, uh, <laughs> a little bit uh, um, behind on, uh, on things. And, um, but it takes time. But those are, those are among the, if you want to call it cultural shocks, uh, for me, as I moved in, um, besides obviously being away um, from, you know, the friends that I grew up with, the family. Uh, when, I remember when I first moved in, it was winter, right? And, a winter in yeah. New York City? You moved here in the winter yes. in the New York City area? In New Jersey, yes. Winter in New Jersey. 
And I can say that now the winters are a little bit more uh, pleasant than what I remember 20 years ago that they were. <laughs> and for the audience who doesn't know, um, Israel weather is very similar to California to many degrees. And I, I used to live in the mountains in the north. I grew up there. So maybe it's a little bit cooler. Maybe once every couple of years you have snow, but it never really gets as cold as it gets here in New Jersey. And I'm not trying to complain to, uh, you, know, compare, you know, to other states that it's, it's colder, but for me, it was uh, very cold. So I remember getting into, the, into a small apartment, uh, just moving in. And at that time there was no WhatsApp. There was no other means to call, um, you know, cheap means to, to call overseas. It was winter, it was snowing, so I couldn't go anywhere. I did not know anybody. My wife was working. She was not home all day long. And I remember sitting with myself in a house, in a small apartment with just, um, you know, a sofa and a desk, not even having a TV, trying to keep myself busy with something. And that was hard. That was hard. And I remember after three months of doing it, I told my wife that I want to go back. <laughs> it's not for me, you know. Um, but one thing led to another. One crisis led to another solution, an idea of uh, what can be, uh, what's the potential, and and the stars got aligned, and that's how I got the, you know, rolled into Toys R Us and Amazon, and since then it's just uh, it's history. So, Gil, do you, your wife, and your kids have citizenship here in in, in Israel? Yes, they both have, but all of them have uh, dual citizenship. I'm the only one who was not born here. Okay, nice. Yes. Yeah. So well, my wife, go ahead. Yeah, my, my wife was born here. She grew up in Israel. Uh, and then she was back and forth, back and forth. She studied here in New Jersey. And then on her third year, um, she had an option to choose an overseas uh, one to study abroad. For one year, she chose Israel. She had some family over there. That's where we met. We got married. A year later, we moved here. And then everybody, um, everybody was born here. So and and y'all been in, y'all been in the Jersey area the whole time? Not just New Jersey, but the the same city, <laughs> the same town. Yeah. Okay. Um, since you have like a, like a tech startup, you spend a lot of time in New York City with the startup scene there, or you may like just deal with, stay in Jersey and deal with Jersey startup scene? Yes. So I've, I've attended one accelerator like um, about eight years ago. It was in New, in New York um, and pretty much connected me with other startups in that space uh, in New York City. I'm still very much connected in, in what's happening with New York, uh, in New York. Um, and and it's, it's interesting because it's very different than the Valley. Uh, I will say it's, it's just a different space, different type of segments and, and a different pace and personalities than what you may see in the Valley from my understanding. Of it. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I've been both places for visits and like it's, it's, it's a different mm-hmm. vibe, different, just, just, it's just different, yeah. you know. Not, not saying anyone's good or bad or whatever it be, but they're just, they're definitely different. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, it's definitely different. But listen, eventually you find your passion and you find what you want to do. And some people, you know, in my case, it came in my mid twenties. Uh, some people it comes in later. It's just, but once you do, you're, you're all in. And you don't care. You don't watch the clock. You don't, um, you, you just, you put your all in, you're all in. You're all in. It's just a matter of time. But I've seen it happening with people in their forties. You know, either you call it midlife crisis. And suddenly they're getting tired of what they've done uh, through the entire career and are either opening up a new business or they're uh, joining in a new venture. Um, actually, I'm getting close to the age group where some of my friends are going through this right now. So it's very, very interesting to see the stages in life. Yeah, and there's plenty of examples. Like, you know, you know, Colonel Sanders started KFC at like 50 or 60. Grandma Moses, <laughs> she started, she didn't start paying like she was 80 or 81. So there's plenty of examples out there where people like, you know, found the past like, Kind of later on in life, so I think I'd be open up to new ideas and doing new things. I think without without yeah. a doubt. Yeah, I'm sure. Also, you had uh, something that led you to do what you're doing right now. Jason. Yeah, at a pretty late stage. Yeah, after my army <laughs> career, I got a startup tech bug without a doubt. Yeah, and that's all <laughs> all by happenstance, all by accident, without a doubt. Um, yeah. Can, can you talk some about? I think you have a partnership with a company out of Columbia called Pro Columbia. Can, yeah. can you talk about that and how that happened? 
Sure. So one of our, um, actually one of our uh, um, investors is, is connected in, in the space of, in, in DC, okay, is well connected in that area. And through one connection to another through her, uh, we got in touch with the embassy in Colombia as they were looking to see how they can help their manufacturers um, sell more or penetrate into the US market. So we had a few meetings with them, um, mainly virtual, but th there were also uh, face-to-face meetings where we described to them our business model versus um, everybody else. So we described the fact that we're not, we're not only uh, an importer here that will just import the product. So it's not just a peer-to-peer, -peer, but we're actually opening the doors for many other importers or many other retailers that can actually sell the product, assuming that the price is right and the product is actually what the there is demand for it. But if there is a demand for it and the price is right, we can put the most amount of eyeballs on those products more than anybody else, most likely that they can ever come across. So we we started this dialogue, we had some few webinars, we and we started working with different um, manufacturers from Colombia and helped them actually penetrate the US market. And that has been very successful engagement for us so, so far, for us and those uh, manufacturers from overseas. And we're definitely looking to replicate that to other, um, other countries. We have a few other countries already in the pipeline that's being worked on uh, worldwide, but uh, we're looking to replicate the same momentum. So, but, uh, it's amazing. So I, I want to ask this in more detail later, but how do you like vet the quality of the, of the stuff on your platform? Like how do you make sure people stuff, put up stuff that's actually high quality or at least a minimum level quality you need for your platform? How do you like, obviously you can't send people yeah. to every come to your world, I don't think. So how do you make sure that's like, you know, done? Sure. That's, that, that, that's a valid question. And that's, um, that's a question that's harder to uh, get answered to if you try to work at scale than when you have a tremendous amount of portfolio of products that you're trying to offer. But the basic, the basic element of what we're um, emphasizing to the manufacturers, we tell them, listen, at the end of the day, you're offering those products on, you're, you're the one who's taking the risk, right? It's you're the one who's manufacturing them. It's you are, the one, you are the one who's actually paying for the transportation to get it into the US. You're the one who's gonna pay for storage in the US. We're just the marketing engine, we're the sales engine, but it's, you're taking the risk all the way through. So if you're not gonna follow through with good quality products, at the end of the day, after the first sale or two, if customers start complaining, your product's gonna be turned off and then it's not worth it. Then you spend all those thousands over thousands of dollars and month over month of worth of investment, basically you threw them you know, out the trash, it's not worth it. So we're putting the, the, the responsibility on them while on our end, we're more monitoring the metrics and the responses from the customers. And of course, before we go and market it, you know, going heavy down on the marketing, and aggressive marketing, we let the order sprinkle through. Right? We wanna see, we wanna get some customer feedback. We're giving them some few trial doubts, few samples, and trying to ask for their, their feedback. And if the feedback is good, then we're opening up the floodgates for a significant amount of um, orders to step in. But if the feedback is not good for out of some few tests, then we take it back to the manufacturer. Tell them, Listen, this is not, not going to work out. Have you had to kick anybody off the platform yet for, for whatever reason? Uh, we had in a very extreme uh, case, actually. We had, and it's actually not necessarily a seller, but was more of a buyer, it was extremely nasty. Nasty to our uh, employees, nasty to um, even nasty to themselves in some cases. And so we we believe in no no we have like a no tolerance to um, to um, to certain behavior that we may seem we may deem to be inappropriate. Like if somebody's I don't know you know there's there's reason and there is room sometimes to raise concerns or complaints. And as long as they're done in a respective way, that's fine. But if you add some juicy curses every day, um, maybe we can tolerate it once and then point it out that, hey, please watch your tone, watch your language. We understand what you're trying to say, but there's a way to convey it. But if they continue in that way, uh, whether it's right or not, we can argue about it, but that language is we're not going to tolerate it. And therefore we said, listen, it's not, if you 
cannot watch your tone, not watch your language, then it's not for us. We got to be respectful. It's about in a business to business, it's all about relationship. It's not just, and, and you know, the way the, our approach here is not about just, it, we're really trying to build up a connection with the customer as well as with, the, with um, the manufacturers, right? It's super important to us. We're very different than other platforms that for them, it's just a machine. It's just a computer, it's a transaction. And then to get a hold of a person on the other side, it's really difficult. Our approach is very different. And we're tra- really, really trying our best to be personalized and pay attention and reach out and talk and, and build up that connection. And I think that's what makes, a, uh, what makes us different than many other selling platforms that are out there. But yeah, that, that was the reason why uh, eventually we kicked someone out. It was a very uh, unique case, only case that I can remember, um, or at least that I'm aware of. But it is what it is. Just stay yeah. respectful. Everything will be fine. Can, can you talk some about how your time in uh, Toys R Us at Copper America help get you ready to become an entrepreneur here in America? Sure. So Toys R Us, I can tell you that Toys R Us was actually um, quite surprised when I first came in there because um, you, you expect corporate America, right? So you follow certain rules and there is, you expect some red tape, you expect this, but actually the, the environment itself was very entrepreneurial. Um, you know, I was working with um, some of the C-level executives at that time and um, it was like a free you know, pretty much an open, open check. Okay, go ahead and do what you believe in and go give it a try and, and try to um, make a difference in the organization. Though, So the culture was there, besides the fact that the place, the headquarters itself was very magical with uh, all the toys uh, around. That was really magical. As, as, uh, I'm sure if, if I was a kid, uh, it would have been even more magical for me, um, but it was exciting. And, but it, it really started when I first um, came to work with Amazon on the other side. And, and again, we're talking about the Amazon of 2002, 2003, right? That's not the Amazon of today, but the, the way of thinking, the approach, the methods, um, I noticed at that time that there was something different about them. There's, there's just, there's, they see the bigger picture in the longer run and it's not just about the next financial uh, report, you know, the next quarter's financials reporting. It, it's in the longer run. And I think that's what really triggered my entrepreneurial uh, spirit, just being close to it. Um, how, how, how old were your kids when you, when you were at Toys R Us? How what? How, how old were your kids when you were at Toys R Us? Were they born yet? Um, no, I'm no, not yet. Single. Not yet. No. Oh man, the, no. The, I, 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 they always say, "Dad, man, you should still be at Toys R Us." You know, can you imagine you're like uh, being a little kid and you're like your your dad actually works at Toys R Us? All the all the no, benefits. Nothing. No, nothing. I uh, and I knew Toys R Us actually from Israel because they were there as I grew up. So for me, Toys R Us was magical. Uh, yeah. Just just uh, attending them. Uh, I, still can't no, I, believe, I still can't believe they went out of business. That just still blows my mind. It's a shame. It's a shame. There, there's really, I try to go back to the steps of what, what might have led them. I, I think that, I think the major difference, they, they had two issues. You know, just looking back at my, you know, for my time, of course, the, they bankrupted, you know, more than a decade and a half after I left. But my time, there were two, there were, there were a couple of things that basically held them back. One, they didn't believe in the internet that much. That's the killer really right there. Going. Yeah, they just didn't. And, and the, the partnership with Amazon was, was part of it. They just, um, they kind of gave it a chance. Um, and I remember pitching it, but they kind of gave it a chance, but they weren't really full in. Never really went all in. And I think that's one of the biggest misses that they've done as a company. And the second, when they did come in uh, into the e-commerce world, they never really combined it with their um, brick and mortar stores. They separated it. And I think it's one of the most foolish things that one uh, a retailer can do. And I see still retailers do it today, to be honest. I, I, I don't want to throw some people I know under the bus publicly, but uh, I still see some retailers do it today. And, and it's, it's, it's a huge mistake. 
Yeah, yeah like, you already got the presence, you know. Yeah, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, but you looking back like, how do you not? How can you not see this? Right, it's like it's almost like a simple decision nowadays. But of course, back then, I mean, who knows what was going um, on? I, I tell I tell you, one of the things that I've seen in in many of those um, uh, corporates in, in discussions that takes place in the higher ups, you know, usually when 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 you work in such an organization, um, I want to assume, even though I never seen. Their, their paychecks, but they're getting paid quite well, okay? Now you think to yourself, okay, do I need to speak up right now? And maybe my boss will not like what I'm about to say. And then maybe the next thing I know, I may lose my job or I'll just keep my mouth shut, collect my paycheck and just do as I've been told. Yeah, you're and right. I, I've seen more of the culture that I've, and I've seen it across Many executives, I, I've seen it first time that they just keep their mouth shut. And, and, and then offline, after the conversation is done, they're like nodding their head. I can't believe it. Whatever it is. So, well, speak up. Say, I mean, if you believe this, this organization is about to jump off a cliff, you know it's the wrong thing. Speak up. Otherwise, sooner or later, anyway, you're going to be out of the job. You're going to be let go. You're not going to stay around. But they're just collecting their check and they're just saying, okay, no, why, why should I take the risk? You know, if my boss, my CEO or my COO or whatever it is, that's what they want to do. They know. It's on them. It's not on me. I don't want them to take the responsibility. It's their gate. And, and, and that culture, um, I've seen it in many organizations. I've seen it in many executives. Um, it's, and, and that's eventually the, the culture that drives those businesses down. It's yeah, that, that's unfortunate. I, I agree with you, right? Like so many senior people don't have the more aptitude or you know ethics to speak up, you know, all that kind of stuff. Or, you know, another thing too, I think, I think too many CEOs, you know, surround themselves with yes people, right? They exactly. don't, they, you don't have like, you know, you need like, you know, different opinions, different backgrounds, you know, someone who's not your boy or girl, so to speak, you know, to tell you the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's usually, you know, when, 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 even when someone is getting parachuted, into organizations, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to fill up the organization with their people that they trust. But those are the people that basically follows them. They're not usually those are not the people that uh, uh, argue with them or 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 get into certain debates. Uh, in many cases, now again, it depends on the culture. I'm not not trying to generalize. There's many extremely very good executives that I've seen that again, it was that were parachuted into the organization and brought a very good and strong talent that really made a, made a lot of a difference. And sometimes, uh, many times actually rescued organizations from going bankrupt. Um, I've seen it uh, firsthand, but you know, the, it, it's usually people that are coming from very specific cultures, very specific background. Um, you, can, you can see the differences. You can almost, almost guess it to a certain degree which, you know, from what they're coming from, what background and how they're going to lead their organization when they're getting parachuted. So, Gil, I, I found a Medium article you did. I don't remember when you did it, but the article was three things you need to do to shake up the industry. Can you talk about that? Sure. So I tell you to, to, to shake up an industry first, in my opinion, you need to know it. You need to live in it. You need to breathe it. And you need to love it. Okay. Um, for example, I, I'll, I'll use something that maybe others will know. I cannot shake up the, the medical insurance industry. Not because I don't love it, not because I don't want to, you know, disrupt it, just because I don't know enough, right? I'm not there. I didn't grow up in that space. I don't have enough knowledge. I'm not going to be the right candidate to go ahead and try to uh, disrupt this space. So first of all, you really got to know what you're doing. Uh, and have the experience. Second thing, you got to surround yourself with talent that knows what they're doing. And that talent better be smarter than you. Okay. You just need to how to connect them together. And the reason why you need them to be smarter than you uh, in certain aspects, okay, not necessarily in all of them, but in certain aspects, because they need to be able, you need, you need people around you that are capable of doing what you are not capable of doing. You know how to connect the dots together. But then you need someone that is specializing in specific dots and handling dots uh, better so they can do a better job. That's the second thing. And the third thing is you got to find a way to 
um, you, you got to have that will inside you. Some people call it passion. Some people call it uh, perseverance, uh, grit to not let go. Not let go. You got, you're going you gonna to go against many no's. You're going to go against uh, people who are going to look down at you. You're going to come, you come across people who are going to tell you you're doing the biggest mistake and you're wasting your time and going to demotivate you left and right. But you got to see that as a noise. It's just simply noise. That's it. You got to move on. And if you believe in what you're doing and if you have the right team, there's nothing that's going to stop you. And I, I believe that's the fundamentals of disrupting any industry or anything you want to disrupt in life. So, Gil, have you raised any funds for your company or are you bootstrapped everything so far? I bootstrapped. I uh, raised money so far still from angels. And uh, now we're into our Series A round and we're talking to very strategic investors. Uh, things are moving well, but I need to uh, <laughs> I need to keep my uh, um, uh, mouth uh, closed right now with about uh, you know where we are in the negotiation stages. Yeah, understood. But, um, Can you talk us through the process of how how you decide to go from bootstrapping to like going looking looking for fundraising? Like, what's the pro Like, when did you say, hey? I can't grow like I want to doing this now. I need to go start funding, raise, raising funds. How does that thought process work for you? Yeah, so so I, I started, obviously I started my, with bootstrapping. I could put about 100K out of my own money in to start it, but, and, and it did start uh, very well. But then you get to a point where you're saying that I need to be able to move faster. You know, this is not, I need more help. Also, you get to the point where you, you really need help. You really need talent. And there's only as much as money, your own money um, can carry you as far as getting the talent you need. And that was the driving factor beyond um, raising funds. The second thing about raising funds was just in general, the way I looked at home roots is that this is, this is really the next big thing and not just another small mom and pop uh, type of a business, right? And I did not want it to end up as a small mom and pop business. I wanted that to be the next big thing and for that, you need, you need money, you need support, and you need smart money. You need money that knows what you're doing, money that understands the space and can support you with uh, whether that's um, regards to door openings or whether that's from a, a piece of advice or, um, you know, just be of uh, emotion, even sometimes emotional support, because it ain't easy. So, uh, that's what drove me to to get um, to go out there and and raise funds. Can can you pass on any lessons learned that you have? Yes. Um, one, don't sell yourself short. I can say that. Believe in yourself. Believe in what you're doing. And but it's very important that you come out as a positive person a visionary person and a subject matter expert. Like, I think what, what eventually what investors want to hear and eventually see when you get to the due diligence process, obviously, so it's not just about the talking, it's also about proving, but they want to hear about the good things at first. They don't want to hear about the complaints, the, the, the challenges, the difficulties. They know it's difficult. Everybody knows that starting a new business, it's difficult. Everybody knows that disrupting an industry is difficult. You don't need to tell them that. They want to hear about the good things, about you, about your business, about your vision. Where do you see your company in a couple of years? You know, you always have the question of an interview question. Okay, what do you, where do you see yourself in five years, right? Or in 10 years? It's the same thing here. Same thing applies. Where do you see your company in five years, 10 years? Where will it be? And that's the vision that you got to sell. And eventually you got to be, and I'm not a salesperson by definition. I will not consider myself to be, but you have to learn how to sell and you have to do it with. And, the, the, and, and it's all about, and one last thing I can tell with the selling, you gotta be a good storytelling, story, storyteller. You have to be, you have to tell the story of what led you to do what you're doing today. Uh, where do you see it in the future? And why is that the next big thing? And it's about the storytelling. 
And you have a very short amount of time to tell your story. Usually it's five to seven minutes. Um, after that, um, you pretty much lost, your, your, lost that in the opportunity if the story has not been uh, registered in the other side. Gil, the other. change the subject a little bit. How, how does a, a company or manufacturer or really be get on your platform? What's the process for them doing that? Sure. So they go, they go to www.homeroots.co and there is at the bottom, there on the footer, there is a section there to uh, apply to be a supplier, right? That will take them to a page where they're basically filling um, their company information, right? You know, they're not where they're from, um, how they heard about us, you know, some contact people, and then they submit the form, right? To um, the application to our review. At that point in time, one of our account managers will review it. And in most likely, unless, you know, something is really fishy, uh, they will reach out to this company and start engaging with them and help them um, coming on board. Now, what does coming on board mean? It's coming on board basically means that we need their products. We need their products loaded onto our platform. And then eventually we need the physical products placed somewhere in the state. So we have our account manager that basically reaches out and help them through that process and support them. And that's, that's pretty much it. It's pretty straightforward, actually. It's pretty, I will say it's pretty easy. Okay, so, so, not, so what you're saying is not rocket science? It's, it's pretty doable? No, not at all. It's pretty straightforward. Um, it's like if any of our audience is familiar of how to sell on Amazon, you know, they'll find our platform to be even much easier than that. Um, it's, it's very similar process, just more straightforward. Um, less clicks, I will say, less... Uh, less uh, screens to navigate, uh, but it's a very similar process. And as soon as they upload the products and assuming that the products are in the state, that's it. We're gonna start uh, working on marketing and, and sales and the rest is history. So Gil, can you explain to us like sort of kind of, how does the furnace industry work? Like, like how do they decide what to build? Like how do we, how does it get manufactured? Like, how do I mean, you know, like do this? Like, you go, like, you know, like we'll say, like, you know, Seldon's furniture or Lazy Boy or Ashley's furniture. Like, how do you decide what, what to build, what people want? Like, because well, hopefully, yeah, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, so I tell you, there is uh, one of the things in, in, so this industry is very antiquated to begin with, right? And so, if, if you were, if you were to go back in time, um, uh, you know, 30 years. We will think, okay, what's the difference now between how it was 30 years ago? And then we'll go back in time. I think the only thing that we'll see that much of a difference is that the catalogs that are being uh, presented to customers or potential customers, instead of being handed over in a paper catalog, now we're being, in some cases, being handed over in a USB drive. Okay, that's the most advanced that happened. But many of those companies are, um, you know, the, the way that they're deciding and again, I, I, I'm, I'm talking just from my experience with the companies that I've been exposed to. I'm not declaring that everybody works in that way, but they're trying to get some level of engagement from their existing customers and usually some of the stores to see whether there is some interest with some products. Okay, so they're showcasing them the products, whether that's in the paper catalog or USB drive, whatever it is, and trying to gauge their interest through that, if that's something that they may be willing to bring into stock. Now, most of the industry, majority of it, is still operated by brick and mortar stores, less than online. So there is our online sales, you know, obviously Wayfair is there and leading it in Amazon and you've got Overstock, you got House, you've got some other uh, leading um, companies um, that are specializing in furniture, but most of the industry is really done in brick and mortar stores. And therefore the selling is, is really by samples and getting that um, those samples into the stores and getting that engagement. And if there is more engagement, then they decide to order uh, in bulk or manufacturing um, in a larger capacity for the larger audience. But a lot of it is also taking risk, right? You don't know necessarily if that's going to be a hit or not. It's it's really uh, tough to know upfront whether a certain products that you're gonna manufacture are really going to generate the interest. Um, because the interest is based on, you know, what the retail store is gonna tell you that they think it's gonna work. 
but when it gets to the consumer, you never know, right? So it's, it's a little bit more um, challenging there, in my opinion, companies, um, sometimes they're overproducing goods and getting stuck with the merchandise. Some companies, the result going under, there are some companies that during the pandemic period have gone under that I know many, many, many factors actually have gone, up, have gone under. Um, but that, that's pretty much how the manufacturing decision is done in, in many of the manufacturers um, that we're familiar with right now. So, Gil, so of course, this is your 20, 2022, but a lot of people, as far as tech, still, you know, deal like they're back in 1982. How would you convince someone, hey, to buy furniture online or use your platform online when they were like, no, I'm going to go in person to the brick and mortar store? How would you convince them, no, buy online is actually a, a better experience for you? It's a good, good question, Jason, because I'll tell you what, I, I stopped convincing. Uh, it's one of my lessons learned. Uh, when I first, started this business, I actually, I actually met companies and I was trying to convince them to come on board and sell their products through Home Roots. And of course they didn't know what Home Roots is. And I remember being asked many questions, what are you? Are you a brick and mortar store? And I said, no, I'm not. Are you an e-commerce site? Well, we are online, but we're not e-commerce in the way you think we are. We're not a direct to consumer e-commerce. Uh, and of course, we're not um, a designer, a home stager. So people did not really know what we are. And it was very difficult for people to convince or to understand what we do. And I've heard many no's at first. And then I realized that instead of spending my time trying to convince people to come on board, let me try to spend my energy on the people that want to hear more and are interested in learning more and work with them to make the best, to give them the best experience, whether that's selling or buying experience that I can possibly can. So I stopped convincing, actually. I, that's a lesson learned. And if, if somebody want, does not want to come on board because they want to do stuff on their own, let them be. It's fine. I have no objections. And we have many of those, by the way, that um, uh, maybe now it's less than, than before, because we've already proven our worth. But some people say, you know, no, or maybe I just want you for this, this piece of what all homeless offer or what I want or offers, or I want just this piece of what homeless uh, may be offering in the future. And he said, okay, uh, doesn't matter. It's up to you. You so want to come on board? So you figured out who your customer was not and then just ignore them completely. Ignore it completely. It's not worth the energy. Yeah, no. I, I agree. I, I agree with you. So, Gil, uh, so go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I say the same thing to my team. When, when they go and meet with potential customers um, or users, I tell them the same. Listen, you, you give your pitch. You give your best pitch, right? And then if they say no, respectfully, you shake their hands virtually or you say thank you and you walk away. Don't spend your time. It's not worth it. But if somebody says, okay, I'm interested to see more. I want to know. Okay, that's interesting. That's what, in their mindset, or they already want to, you know, they want to do something. And maybe they don't know it yet, but they're curious. You want the curious people. And those are the people that eventually will be more engaged and will give, um, will get a better experience out of it because they will really want it to be successful uh, relationship. The ones that know, and I think, I think actually the same applied to any, any, any business. And I recommend that um, to any, any business in any industry, in any space. If somebody just doesn't want, don't argue with them. Just yeah, that, 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 that's such a great teaching point, a great lesson. I see so many entrepreneurs waste so much time trying to convince people, oh, my products mm -hmm. are best, the features are best. If you buy whatever, you know, and they're just like hitting their head against a brick wall, they, don't, they don't, just don't realize it. No, it's not. And, and it's less about, I tell you, it's not, uh, I think also my, my pitch has changed and my team's pitch has changed, um, has changed over, over the years because we realized that it's less about what we offer and it's more about the value. What is it, what's in it to the user? 
what's in it to your customer. And if you're able to pitch that in a way that they get it, then they'll buy into the idea. Now, some people you may say, okay, listen, we can give you or through homework, you can get more sales. Bottom line, it's it's more dollar to your pocket. And you'll be surprised. Some companies tell us I can't handle more sales right now. I'm overbooked. And then when you try to dig in to why you're over, why you're overwhelmed, why you cannot handle more sales, they start telling you, you listen, but that's the reason why we form home roots. Exactly for those reasons that you have reached the capacity that you now cannot accept more sales, which is the worst thing you can do as a business. It declines sales, right? Sales eventually what pays our salary, right? That's what pays our existence. Without customers, we do not exist. So if you decline sales, that's not a good sign in my opinion. It's a warning sign. And uh, we see that. So we try to explain that, but some people still live in, uh, you know, <laughs> in their fish tank. So let them live in their fish tank. So, okay. Gil, I might be misquoting this, but I believe that you, you, you'd like to say that uh, you want to make B2B sales as easy as B2C sales. Can you explain that and how you're mm-hmm. trying to make that change? Yes. So I, I actually believe that even B2B has to be easier to B2C. And it has to be easier. Um, but basically, I, I believe that the shopping experience would be the same because, you know, when you want uh, all of us, what it is businesses? Businesses is, is a group of people, right? A group of individuals. Right, that have teamed up. But the individuals, as individuals, we go and we buy online on different marketplaces, different websites that we love. right? And then when we go and actually buy wholesale, we expect the same experience. right? We've seen what happened over the past 10 years, 20 years uh, online with, with the consumer shopping. We want the same experience when we buy from our vendors. So the whole essence of home roots, and we're focusing on the furniture and home decor, but the whole essence of home roots is really to create the same experience, meaning how it comes into reality is the fact that you can order at any given time. You know exactly how much is in stock, which is opposed to, and I will soon mention how it is done in the industry in, in opposed to, to home roots right now, but you know exactly how much in stock. Before you place an order, you know more or less when you're going to get it. You have date ranges, so you have expected shipment and expected delivery. When you order it, you know exactly how much it costs you. You know how much you need to pay for shipping if there is any uh, shipping costs associated with that. And then you place an order. You got multiple payment methods. Also terms depends if you reply to it. And you place an order. And you can place an order 24-7. And it shouldn't be magical. It should not be like crazy things. It should not be something that is, uh, you know, out of the ordinary. But, but it is in our industry, because the way that right now things are done, uh, a lot of it are, um, you know, many, many manufacturers in this industry, the way that they work is they book orders of the phone. There's no website to accept the orders. There's, there's, there's nothing like that. So they either send over the order through a sales rep online, book it over the phone. Some cases being sent as a purchase order via email but then you have to follow up and make sure that somebody actually gets it. it it's done very out, it's very outdated, very um, antiquated. And it's just, uh, it's just shocking, but it should be very straightforward. So our experience is really to make it the like same as what consumers are facing. We want to give the same, the same experience. Now we talk about the ease of buying. I can tell you also that we're striving to get it to the point of the same benchmarks as what um, Amazon, is basically said, which is not only that I want to buy at any given time and I want the convenience of buying it, I want to get it as soon as possible. I am going to get it tomorrow. I want to get it today even, right? Now, putting drones to carry furniture, that might be a little bit more challenging. Uh, uh, I'm sure there's still going to be a few safety risks with that. <laughs> yeah, that might be a little bit more challenging at this moment in time, but we're striving for that. We're not there yet, being honest, but we're striving for that. We want to get it faster, the fastest possible to the customer, uh, wherever they are. So that's that's this that's the second thing. And the third thing is about really the fact that you you want to get a good service. You want to get the best service possible. You don't want to deal with companies who's gonna give you a hard time with hey, 
we do not accept returns or all sales are final or um, there was something, some problem, a defect in the product and they tell you, okay, ship it back to us on your own expense and don't want to deal with it. There's some, there are service issues in this industry and we're doing our best and I think we're succeeding in that as well in changing that mentality and setting up uh, an example for the rest of the industry of how customers should be treated. So how, how, how would that work? I suppose I, I go on your platform, I order a fire pit. I get the fire pit delivered to my house and it doesn't work. Like a, something's missing, it doesn't work at all. How does the return work? Is that with me and your so, platform, me and the company? So if it, if it doesn't work, we'll just come and collect it from you. Okay, so y'all y'all come and get it. So you come and get it, or we'll okay. tell you to dispose it, or donate it, or whatever. But we we will make sure that you are getting that you're being taken care of. That's Either great. for a replacement, or um, okay, you know, so many, so many companies. Hey, ship it back to us. Like, how much of the ships it back to you? Right, I will have time yeah, to find a box and go to the post office and FedEx, whatever, and ship it to you. You, you can. That's a, that's a, that's the exact problem. I mean, you just can't. Right. Sometimes you open up the box and you don't have the you don't have the, the carton anymore, right? And it's only only when you actually open it, and the carton is already um, you know kind of turned apart or cut off or whatever it is, uh, only then you found the defect yeah. in the product. Come so on. we try to work with the customer. Now, listen, this is heavy heavy. Usually, it's heavy stuff. It costs a lot to move it from point A to point B. It's not cheap. It's not like shipping uh, an envelope. All right, we're talking at times, um, you know, 80 to 200, 300. If it's a sofa, $500 depends where, where you're shipping it across, you know, um, coast to coast. It really depends, right, in the zones. So we understand that. So we're trying to work with the customers to see whether that's through compensation, financial compensation. If that doesn't work out, then we try to get their a replacement. We try to send over someone that can come with the boxes, repack. Uh, but no matter what, we take care of the customer and we try to get to some agreement with them that they, at the end of the day, feel um, comfortable because things can happen. Listen, you never know. I right? think there will be some manufacturer defect. Uh, there can be the, the carrier uh, did something to, to the box. You never know. It doesn't happen frequently, but it can happen. I mean, it's, it's part of buying alone. So I have to guess if you have a manufacturer, like a two of high or percentage are like, returns or whatever case it be, you, you like kind of get them off the platform, right? Or, or you just walk through. Yeah, we, we will talk to them first. We will try to, we're a little bit less than some other platforms that may just uh, kick people out very quickly. Uh, we will talk to the suppliers. So we'll start off with just turning the products off and then giving the information. And then again, through the account management group, we will reach out, have the dialogue with the manufacturer and ask them, listen, this is the evidence, what's happening. Right. As a human interaction that will happen, part of human interaction. So this is what, what we're seeing. Those are the complaints. Now, what are you going to do about it? Now, if there's something you can do about it immediately, like sometimes it's like, I don't know, repackaging, something simple, then okay, not a problem. We'll turn the, the product back on. Um, but if it's something that it's the entire batch is defective, then obviously they need to remanufacture something from scratch. Right. But we're finding those things through dialogue and the whole idea is to to work with both sides and understanding things sometimes you know there's things that has nothing to do with um the manufacturings it might be just that the carrier that was used was not the right carrier for that um for that cost so sometimes we need to switch carriers sometimes it's uh, it's a problem with um i don't know uh, it, Sometimes, you know, you even have customers that. Uh, yeah, I was, I was ask you, how often do you, how do you have to deal with customers having like, I'll say like unrealistic expectations of the product? Um, I think we're seeing less of that now. Maybe at the beginning, there used to be more of those. Actually, there's, there's something with like, it's a, like an Amazon that if we, we've seen customers that even without talking to us, first thing they've done is just, dispute their cart, All right, the first thing, didn't even talk to us. We didn't even get a notice that there is an issue. So the whole dialogue was using with, with the credit card company or with the creditor, it's not even direct conversation. And those are the type of customers that we actually 
I'm not sure that those are the customers that we really want because we want to build a relationship and things can happen. But in, in, we can take care of the customers. We want to take care of the customers. And so, but we, we got to make sure that there is a, that we can actually develop a relationship. And the us, is very, very important. So, but we do have customers that at times have unrealistic expectations. Some cases, um, I don't know, we, we had a situation um, and it ha basically happened more when, um, I'll tell you a story that happened last year where there was a, a major issue with uh, FedEx in California, right? Where anytime we ship the package, FedEx never, and it wasn't just a home roots problem, it was a whole regional problem with FedEx. And FedEx kind of admitted to that at that time that they were not, because of the volumes of pickups and boxes, the, the drivers, when they collected the goods, when they actually picked them up, they didn't scan the packages whatever it is. And the packages were actually scanned uh, when they reached the hub or sometimes in the second hub into FedEx. So they were, you, so even though we shipped it, let's say today, you would have not known until Wednesday or Thursday that the package was actually scanned and it actually in transit and might actually be already delivered to the customer. And we had customers that were, had the unrealistic expectation with understanding why it takes so much time to scan a package. And it was really an inconvenience for us to explain to them what's happening with FedEx, what's happening with Cal in California, in that area, that there is um, a real logistical challenge. And we refer them some, you know, um, some public information that was available at that time, some announcements that we got internally from FedEx, uh, but that did not satisfy them. They wanted another package. They were not willing to wait another day, or but we knew that it it's on the way. We knew it's this, and so we had we had our moments. Um, but it, but listen, but this is customers. At the end of the day, uh, as I said, with our customers, we do not exist, um, and it's all about uh, working with them, explaining them. And, and listen, at, at the end of the day, you know, you 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 try your best. You, you give your best, and uh, and I think I think deep down inside they understand that as well, and they obviously they come they keep on coming back, right? So obviously they're getting some level of service that is better than the competition, that makes them want to come back, and they all come back. Yeah, I, I know a couple of weeks ago we ordered our TV online from Costco. They delivered the TV. You know, luckily I paid for the for delivery service, so they delivered it, took it the took it the box, but there was no screw, so there's no way to set the TV up right. So I had to send the TV back. And of course, Costco sent me replaced like in a couple of days, right? But I was like, man, how, how does this TV have no, like there's no screws here. Like put it against a wall. I mean, you, and you never know, like maybe maybe the person who did the boxing had a bad day. Maybe he's quitting that day. Like you never know, right? Yeah, you never know. But but as long as you're, as long in this case, as long as Costco actually took care of you. Yeah, definitely. It, you'll just be, okay, it's a little bit of annoying, but you know what? You're actually going to appreciate the fact that next time, that this will happen to you if it if it will happen as much as annoying at least you trust costco to take oh, yeah. care of you I, I i can tell you i cannot necessarily say the same in our industry i cannot sometimes you you're really gonna have a hard time and this is uh, this is one of the reasons why uh we opened up uh, i opened up home roots because uh, I, I really wanted to create a new standard for service in the industry that I, I believe is lacking. I do believe it's lacking. Gil, what, what do you do for fun? What I do for fun, I like to travel. I spend time with my family and kids. I really love to travel. I love languages. I love learning new languages. And I, I love learning new uh, uh, vocabulary. Um, and, but for me, it's just hanging out with friends and family. That's, that's my... Um, my leisure time but i can tell you that i don't have a lot of leisure time i'll be honest i do work many hours um i i can say that i definitely crossed 100 hours every week at the bottom of that's the lowest amount of hours that i'm spending on a weekly basis in working and, and what's yeah. been some of your favorite travel places for you and your family uh i like to go to the caribbean and um Central America. Okay. So 
Uh, I love Costa Rica. I've been there twice. Uh, and I like the combination. I like the combination of the nature. I like the combination of um, um, some of the excitement and the thrills of the different things that they have there. I love the culture, I love the people. Uh, and it's just beautiful. Uh, honestly, it's heaven. Um, and the beauty of it is really not that far off from here. From where I'm in New Jersey, I think it's about like four and a half or so hour flights. Or if you're in the South, it's even less, maybe like two, two and a half hours. Uh, it's something. So it's super close and it's heaven. So if you haven't been there, I recommend. Uh, but there's many other beautiful countries that anybody can go to. Yeah. You just need to find the time. So Gil, <laughs> so with you working 100 hour weeks on, a, on like a regular basis, how do you how are you taking care of yourself? How are you making sure your wellness is good that you're not burning it out? Uh, that's another good question, Jason. Um, I try to exercise. Um, since I used to exercise until recently, I'm, I had a small injury, so I'm coming back to it. But I try to exercise at least three times a week, more of running and a little bit of um, um, you know body workouts. Spend at least one one and a half hours each time. Um, to just take care of myself, just disconnect and do it. And I think it's, it's super important for a downtime, it's super important for mental health, and it just energizes you. At the end of the day, once, you, once you're done, um, that, that's pretty much it. That's, that's um, what I've been doing besides, you know, the annual checkups uh, <laughs> with the doctors. Uh, but it's funny, but for me, I actually, my, uh, Two of my uh, kids, they, they like to go and, and exercise as well in the gym. And I find it for me uh, an opportunity to spend some quality time with them on the thing that they like to do. Um, obviously, they like to do some other things without their uh, without me and her mom. Of course, of mom. course. The kids <laughs> after all, right? <laughs> the kids. Uh, but I find it in a good way. You know, we're, we're finding, I find a way to kind of uh, bundle with them, spend some time. Uh, with them for that like hour and a half two hours if need be um, and it's a good quality time but so Gil you already talked about this some but he, can you go to more detail about how you how you how you started a company or why you started a company what you focus on right now and what you see your vision of so for the future of your company is sure so I, I started this company because I uh, I felt like I had enough with working for others I felt like I'm not, because when, whatever I was working for others, I was very, uh, anytime, you know, I was put in a certain bracket of, okay, we just need you to do this functionality and just this functionality. Or we just want you to focus on that area and only that and leave the, leave the other things to the rest. And I felt that I'm not utilizing my entire skill set. I felt like I can contribute a lot more, but yet I've been always been put into so certain brackets and I was miserable. I didn't enjoy it. And it was for me like, um, it's like, it's like a golden cage, right? I was compensated very well. Um, I will even say extremely well, but I just didn't enjoy what I was doing. I was very miserable and I felt that I had enough. So one time, I, uh, one day, I kind of discovered my inner courage to quit and, and move on. But it, it, was, it, it was a period of time, you know, in a certain transition, when you first start building something, you work on that like a side hassle. And then up to the moment where you felt, okay, this is, this is enough, and I have to give it a try, and I have to do it on my own. And so that's the reason why. Um, I started that, started a business um, to, to begin with. And it wasn't because, you know, I did not get along with people. It wasn't because um, overall, it wasn't like I did not enjoy what I was doing, but I just didn't feel I was fulfilling myself. So I just, I just quit and got it started. I picked an area, I picked a company in a space of something that I had passion about. I, I really felt like the combination of e-commerce, with technology, with software development, and then furniture. 
this is something that I really had passionate about. I was really passionate about and really wanted to get it started. So that's really what was mo my motive um, to get it going. Um, the way I see home roots in the future is that it will be the future of commerce, future of wholesale, and a future in which companies are entering new markets, as well as a mean to existing companies, existing retailers, or existing um, businesses to find what they're looking for from literally all over the world, but yet it's here in the state or wherever they are in their, because um, it's going to be on a global scale, wherever they are in their local countries. So they can get any product they want from anywhere in the world, but yet don't wait months for it. Wait maybe the first days and then hours. And that's where I would like home to be. I would like the home to be the entry point for every new product introduction. And if you are not going through home roots to introduce your product, then maybe you will never introduce your product. That will be the platform and that might be the only platform or the best, but I will say the best platform to be able to offer those products and to offer those introduction into the market um, as well as finding products um, to enter, um, to, to source, to get into the market. Yeah, I remember a couple of years ago, my daughter and her husband like were trying to buy a dining room table from some store. It was crazy. Like they said, we get the table to you in like four months, two chairs in six months, other two chairs, like eight months. Like what? Yeah. Like this is like ridiculous, right? Like this. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, and I tell this is very antiquated uh, industry and that's how it operates. And that's, uh, and, and it's, you, you can't, in today's day and age, you, you cannot imagine that, um, you know, that's how it operates. You think of online, you think you will go and buy on Amazon, go buy on, on Walmart, you go buy on other places. You get your items the next day or the following. Why this takes like six months? Why? It doesn't make any sense. So we're, we're changing it. And, and, and then at the end of the day, the consumer is going to, you know, they get a favor. Whoever's going to get the products the fastest with the best price ever and the best quality. If you can do those three, you got yourself a winner. And that's, those are the three things that we're continuously improving on from one month, one day to another. And those are the metrics that we've been, that I'm measuring internally our company um, as we move along, as we grow. So that's a good point. How, how did you decide the KPIs or, or metrics to, to decide if you're being successful? And how do you recommend other founders, you know, pick their um, KPIs or metrics? Sure. So, so first I will say, generally speaking, every industry or every type of a company has their own KPIs. But if you're a SaaS company, then one of the KPIs would be how many subscribers do you have? Is the list of subscribers is actually increasing or decreasing or flat? month over month or quarter over quarter, right? And what's the growth ratio? Okay, so it gives you that pretty much that. Um, if you're an e-commerce company, if you're B2C, then you may be looking into less, it might be less about the subscribers, but it will most likely gonna be based on the page views, conversion rates. How many, what is the conversion rate? Is it getting better? Is out of a hundred page views, are you getting two sales, two orders? Is it 2%? Is the next quarter, is it going to be 3%, 4%? Where is it going to? Are you above and all the time comparing yourself to the industry averages and see where you are benchmarking yourself to the industry average? Are you above or below? And, and those are the, some of the KPIs that you can look at. Um, if you are in, uh, so it's, it really depends on the industry. It really depends on your business model that you may need to pick and choose different KPIs. So it's not one size fit all. Right. And, and in our KPIs, obviously, we're looking at the, we're looking at the number of users that we have on our platform. We're looking at the transactions. We're looking at the service that we're providing. How quickly are we giving answers to our customers? How quickly we're getting, um, you know, products delivered? What is the offerings? Is our offering growing or or shrinking? Are we? Um, what is the average order value? Do we have repeat orders? Are our customers happy or not? 
We measure those things. We want to know. We want to give them the best service possible. So those are different KPIs that we measure. And it, it is the things that I'm constantly paying attention to to see an improving trend. And if we don't see an improving trend, that becomes like a point of discussion and discovery. Why, for example, I don't know, this month we got a certain score in certain metrics versus, you know, last time we measured that matrix or that KPI. Why, why was it flat or why, why, why there was a decline? What happened? Right? Was there any specific issues that we need to pay attention to? So it's, it's constantly monitoring it. You have to monitoring. I, you know, monitoring it. I won't recommend monitoring it on a daily basis. This is too much. Uh, also, it's very you know unstable. I will say try to measure it. Um, if you're a young company, you measure it month by month. If you're um, a little bit more mature, I'll say two years, three years into your business uh, age, I will say start going through quarter by quarter and start comparing it to previous year as well and see whether you're actually improving versus last year or last quarter compared to where you are today. Gil, is there anything else that I asked you that I haven't asked you yet or anything else you want to talk about that we haven't covered yet? No, so I think I think you asked very, very good questions. Uh, actually very, very interesting. I'll say my, my um, just I'll say to someone that wants to start a new business, um, just a piece of advice. Um, I'll say that it, it's not going to be easy. It's actually one of the most difficult things that a person can do uh, emotionally as well as uh, even financially, right? There is a burden there. You can't pay yourself the market value that you know you're worth, right? Because the money, the company doesn't make that money, right? You can't, the vice versa. You're the one who's paying uh, the company and not the company pays you at the beginning. But when you get to the point where you feel like the company now drives you forward, that you, the company is now leading you and you are not leading the company, that's where, um, that's, that's your sign that something good is happening, right? That now you feel like the, there is a momentum. The company drives you, there is demand, there is, there is supply, there is, people are asking, um, for your services, people are asking about your companies. There's traction, right? There's emails to answer. There are phone calls to to answer. There's uh, phones to answer. Right? There's you know all those things. Then you know there's something's happening. And now it's just about moving on to the next stage where it's okay. Now let me start thinking about my priorities. What do I need to handle first? And what second? And am I spending my time? on the right things versus not. So then comes the second thing. But first you just want the company to drive you forward um, instead of you constantly pushing things to, to the company. And maybe for the ones on the phone who've yet to uh, launch a company, maybe that sounds a little bit weird at first, but once you get to that point, you, you'll, you'll understand. And I think um, that's a good sign. Just, just something out there for the listeners to, to think about. Thank, thank you for that. Gil, can you give us your social media so people can reach out to you? Your social media for sure. you and your company so people can reach out to you? Sure, so uh, they can basically, my, my favorite platform uh, in social media is LinkedIn, right? Uh, my LinkedIn is the same as my uh, name. It's uh, Gil, G-I-L, and then um, dot B-A-R dash L-E-V, or they can just look for me, Gil, Bar Lev on LinkedIn, they'll find me. Uh, there's not too many Gil Bar Lev out there in LinkedIn still. Uh, so they can find me. Um, I think I have a picture of a smiling face, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, more than happy to connect. Any questions, anytime, somebody need a piece of advice, I'm always happy to help, you know. And to our listeners, we have the links here to the social media on the show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cabinetsaitsalbala.com. Be sure to share the episode with your network and your friends and uh, rate, review, and subscribe to Jason's Cabinet Experience. So, Gil, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. It's been a great talk. And it's a great yeah, to know same you here. Jason, it was an amazing discussion. I, I thank you very much for your time and for the listeners, of course. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day. Thank you.